Mike. Hey, April. Hey, Janelle. How are you? Janelle. Hi. Oh, Hadley's on. Hi, Hadley. I don't see you. Hadley, are you on mute? He said he was on. Uh, let's see. Maybe we'll just, just let him do his thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he just texted me that he's on, but I don't. He's not on because I don't see him. Okay, guys, it's um, it's about six o, it's six o one, and we're gonna give um, folks a few more minutes to jump in, and then um, we'll get started. Okay, we'll we'll start in about a minute or so. All right, it's six, it's six so four. So um, while uh, people are still jumping on, I, I just want to uh, just take care of little housekeeping items. Um, and first, I want to uh, remind everyone, if you don't mind, uh, to keep your phones on uh, silent. 
And um, if you want to ask a question when the time comes, you can use the chat feature to ask a question and then the uh, facilitator will, um, will, will uh, ask the question for you. So just wanted to, to take care of those uh, couple of things. And guys, welcome to a very special edition of uh, Common Bonds' uh, speaker series. This by far is the easiest inter uh, introduction that I will do um, by far. <laughs> Um, I did take a few notes. I just want to make sure I stay on track, but this is going to be very easy for, for, for me. Um, but first, I want to welcome you guys and thank you for joining us again today. Um, today, we are here to have a conversation with the running back, Josh Adams, um, with the New York Jets. Um, Okay, so let me let me get my notes. So I don't I don't I want to stay on track, and I don't want Joshua to say that I'm being long winded. So I'm going to keep it relatively short. There's a whole lot of things I can say, um, but today we're having a conversation with, uh, like I said, Josh Adams. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge a very um, very special people who have joined the call to support Josh. I want to uh, say a special welcome to uh, Coach Hetrick. That's Josh's high school football coach. Welcome, Coach. Uh, coach Denson is supposed to be on. I, I didn't see him jump on, but uh, Coach Denson, if he's not on, he'll be on. He's Josh's uh, Notre Dame running back coach. And I want to say a very special welcome to, to Hadley Inglehart. That is Joshua's agent and he's on. So thank you guys, that's Team Josh. Thank you for joining uh, Josh for this conversation today and welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you um, Joshua Adams. Uh, everything about Josh has always been forward progress, intentional and active. Joshua was always a very active person and a very intentional person. And I wanna, I wanna read you something about how Joshua developed and how he grew up. This was when he was about four. So I took Joshua by the hand, by his one hand and his lunchbox was in his other hand. And we walked down three flights of stairs as Joshua would jump and jump one step and then two. At some point, I had to let his hand go because it was, it, it was much too early in the morning for me to be jumping down steps uh, and Joshua had more energy than I had. Uh, plus he was more fit. But Joshua jump his way down to the front door of our apartment building and, and wait very non-patiently for me. Then we would proceed out the door, turning uh, d turning left toward the church and walked a half a block to the stop sign. Uh, and at the intersection, again, Josh would, would hop, skip, and jump across the street. Uh, and that is really indicative of the energy that Joshua has always had. He's always been very energetic uh, growing up. Growing up also, Joshua had many characteristics that I admired. One of them was his intentional, uh, his intentional movement and his sense of purpose. Joshua always had a sense of purpose uh, and he's also been one who was very committed to the process. I saw this very clearly when he was in high school. Uh, when he tore his ACL in high school, I saw his his commitment to the process. When he when we came home, there was a machine that he had to put his leg in that would move his leg after he was broke uh, tore his ACL to rehab. He had to use a machine to bend his knee back and forth. And I remember the very first time he had to use the machine. He put his leg in and turned the machine on, and the the pain was so excruciating that tears began to come down 
his eyes. And, and me sitting there in the chair watching him, I, I um, immediately jumped up because it looked so painful and, and tears were coming down as I jumped up to turn the machine off. And Joshua put his hand out to me and said, no, mom, through his tears, he said, no, mom, I have to do this. And I learned something very important about Joshua that day, that not only was he committed to the process, but he was able to to push past his pain, to be able to, to achieve what was important to him, his goals. So, so I um, just learned that he was someone who was very intentional, very committed to the process. Um, as I also watched Joshua grow from a boy to a man, he continued to display a great character, great discipline, great focus, and an undeniable sense of purpose. Coach Hetrick, his high school coach, said this of Josh. Some people are just born with that extra stuff, that it factor. Coach Denson, his Notre Dame coach, said this of Joshua, that his journey was anointed by God and that he was proud of Joshua for his leadership and his maturity both on and off the field. I say this about Joshua, that he had a dream one day that he would play in the NFL. And he nurtured that dream. He sacrificed for that dream. He worked for that dream. And most importantly, he believed uh, that God would make his dream come true one day. And so uh, as not to be long-winded, I want to introduce to some and present to others uh, the running back, Josh Adams, AKA my son. But before I do that, I want to also introduce the facilitator for this conversation tonight. The facilitator is um, a, 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 an equally awesome young man, uh, Jason Dumas, who's a board member of Common Bonds. And he's also an outstanding uh, sports newscaster at Cron News in California. Uh, uh, Jason also has undeniable focus and discipline, and he's another example of uh, leadership in, of his generation. So I want to turn the uh, conversation over to Jason and Josh, and you guys do your thing. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome, <laughs> Josh. <laughs> Thank you, April. Yeah, if I ever need someone to like write my autobiography or, or give a speech in my honor, I'm going to call you. All right. You sure can. <laughs> All right. Um, well, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for hopping on this call. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for anyone who maybe this is your first, uh, first time experiencing the Zoe Rogers Speaker Series, um, <clears throat> you know, we hit a number of topics uh, today, specifically. Uh, probably won't be as heavy as a conversation as some of the ones we've had in the past. We're gonna talk about uh, Josh's journey uh, from just a, a little kid growing up outside in a Philly suburb up in the, into his NFL career, and then that perspective that he's gained from his journey, and then all the things he's doing now to give back to his uh, community now that he has a platform. So uh, he has a tremendous journey and I can't wait to share it with everyone. So with that being said, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give the floor to Josh uh, for now. I guess, Josh, tell us about your upbringing. <clears throat> Where were you born? What were your early years like? What was your neighborhood like? Uh, and I guess, how did you, when did you first get into football? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so I was actually born in uh, Abington Hospital. Uh, I don't remember much about that, obviously, but um, I remember uh, we grew up in uh, West Oak Lane, uh, North 16th Street, um, small neighborhood in, in North Philly area. And uh, it was me, my mom, my brother, and my sister. And um, as far as I can remember, most of my time at that age, you know, I was playing outside, um, couldn't really go past the block. So I was either running back and forth down the street, uh, playing football. I had a 
you know, a little tricycle. I, I used to ride the tricycle up and down the street. Um, and pretty much, you know, I was just, you know, that kid I wanted to just go out and, and play around, you know, try to figure out what to do with my energy, just go and have fun. There was a park, you know, that was down the street, the, the neighborhood park. I wasn't allowed to go down there. So, um, but if I did, I had to go with my brother and sister. But uh, as far as I could could see down that street, I was going to run down that end and then and come back the other end. Um, but <laughs> my parents, uh, it was young age, uh, split up. And I remember us uh, moving. I didn't know, you know, why, you know, we were moving, nothing like that. But I just knew that my parents weren't together anymore. And I just remember us, um, you know, vividly, you know, we stayed at a shelter, a uh, women's shelter. I remember that we had to, my mom had to get us a babysitter to watch me and my sister because uh, we were, you know, still young. Um, my brother, who knows where he was at? He's, he was at that age where he's, old enough to go out and experience, you know, life on his own and trying to, you know, see different things. But I uh, remember uh, we had to, you know, move to different places. We stayed with my aunt, you know, a couple of times. And um, I saw that, you know, to my mom, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, whenever we go visit my dad and, and she would come pick us up, you know, you could feel tension. And it, it just wasn't life as I remembered it when I was a younger kid. And when we finally moved to Warrington, um, that was a little bit harder, but, you know, at least we had a, a stable place, you know, to, to lay our heads and, um, you know, we weren't moving around and, and, and it wasn't as hectic. But I just remember uh, seeing my, my brother and sister, you know, having a hard time fitting in me as well. You know, I was in uh, elementary school. I went to Barclay uh, Elementary School and uh, all I wanted to do was just play still, you know, I, I, didn't know anybody in the area. Um, I really only knew the, the kids that were in my neighborhood. Because, um, you know, being one of, you know, the few uh, black kids in the school, uh, I didn't really know how to, you know, form bonds, form relationships with the other kids, you know, because I just didn't see anything that we, we had in common with each other. Because uh, that was, you know, my first, you know, real life experience being around, you know, people that, you know, didn't look like me. So, uh, it was just hard at a young age to form relationships and, and form different bonds with friends. But, you know, as a kid, you don't really, you know, care about all the external things. You just want to, you know, play with the other kids. And if they like, you know, playing tag, you know, y'all friends on that day, you know, we're just going to be friends. So, um, so that right there, just forming those bonds, being active and playing is really how I, I came to, uh, see the bigger picture in, in sports and athletics um, because my dad had me playing basketball, you know, since a young age, since I can remember I was playing basketball and I would always go back uh, into the city and, and play basketball because they had summer leagues in Mount Airy. Uh, so, you know, I was back and forth, you know, going from Warrington to Mount Airy to play sports. And uh, as I got older, you know, a lot of my friends played football, but I hadn't played football, you know, um, I was always, you know, the basketball player, you know, I would play in the street or play out in the grass, but I never played it, um, you know, uh, organized, organized. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I remember, you know, I told my dad, like, yeah, I want to, I, I might want to play football. Um, I don't think I had, you know, told my mom this yet, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, he can make it happen and, and, uh, he could try to get me on a team or something because all of my friends played it. And, um, you know, and I want that feeling of of uh, building connections with, with different people based off this common thing that we all love to do. Uh, it was basketball, but now, you know, I really like football and I want to make more friends, basically, you know, because like I said, when I was younger, you know, that was always hard to do. And I knew that I could do it through sports. Um, so, you know, however it happened, uh, my mom finally agreed to, to let my dad sign me up for football. Uh, and we played for the Monterey Bantams, uh, which is, uh, I think they're still around, but uh, that was also the same, you know, city that I played basketball for. So, you know, easy transition. Uh, and I just remember, <laughs> I, my mom has always been like this, man. Uh, the, first, the first game that I can remember her coming to, she's just standing on the sideline, you know, pacing back and forth, not sitting down, not relaxing. 
or cheering like like the other parents are doing. She just worried the whole time, and and I could tell because it, it took her a lot to to allow me to do that, to allow my dad to sign me up, and and I know she was you know stressed out, you know didn't want me to get hurt or you know injured, you know or or anything like that. So that was really my start uh, playing football, and I remember that. You know, it was hard to, you know, commute back and forth. So I remember uh, my friend, my, well, a lot of my friends, you know, they played football for the Warmster Pioneers. So, uh, you know, they told me, uh, you know, you can come play for us. And, you know, Coach Mike, who was, who you know, one of my dads, you know, he told me I could, you know, play for him. And, and that was really my first time um, getting the full experience of, of playing football because it was with guys that I knew, guys that I lived around. Uh, I had already, you know, got the initial introduction and, you know, kind of knew what I was doing now. And and ever since then, man, I've been having fun playing football. I, that's that's the one thing that I can say is um, no matter, how, you know, how hard it gets or challenging it gets, uh, you know, those those memories, you know, remind me why I started playing in the first place. Remind me why the, the sport is fun, no matter how um, in, industrial it gets or, you know, how Hollywood it may seem, it it's always still that that same game that that I grew up loving. So um, that was really like the foundation of uh, how I got to love the sport. And um, you know, ever since then, man, I, I just tried to go out there and and be the best that I could be, um, knowing that you know one day this road would get me somewhere and and put me in the position to uh, help my family. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to see my family in that position that I have the memory at a young age where we were struggling. And, you know, I was looking on TV, NFL films, NFL highlights, and I saw all these guys and they had all this money and they were able to, you know, feed their families. They were able to be in the limelight and uh, provide for the people that they cared about. And, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, I love this game and what better way to make money doing something that I love and I can make sure that uh, my family isn't in that position again. And I pretty much, man, I, looking back on it, I didn't realize it, but I, I, I dedicated everything I had to trying to perfect my craft and um, try to make sure that I, I got there because uh, my dad and my mom would always ask me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I told him I want to, I want to play, you know, in the NFL. And I didn't really have any, any other options, honestly. <laughs> I know I should have probably, but at a young age, that's what I wanted to do. And I really believe that, you know, if I stay focused and I continue to uh, stay close to God, that I, that I could do those things. Nobody could tell me otherwise. So, um, you know, everything from middle school up, I, I dedicated all my time to, to trying to be better and trying to uh, perfect my craft. So that's, you know, the football journey for me. Um, you know, pro there's probably more details uh, that that I left out, but that's just how focused my mind was on on those things, playing football and, and helping my family. And, and that's really how it started for me. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah we can get to some of those details, but uh, <clears throat> it's great that you had tunnel vision uh, because sometimes that's all you need, a dream and tunnel vision, and you can, you know, achieve more than you even thought you were originally capable of achieving. Uh, so that's, it, it's cool hearing, hearing that perspective from you. Now, you mentioned when you first, you know, when you first moved to, to the suburb uh, with, with your mom and siblings and how it was a little, you didn't use the word uncomfortable, but it was just a, a little uncomfortable, I, I guess, first fitting in because you were the only black kid in the neighborhood. Do you feel like football helped ease that adjustment uh, to help you, I guess, spread your wings socially in an environment that you weren't used to? Yeah, I think, um, like I said, I mean, football, obviously I'm, I'm biased, but it's just really a great sport. And um, it, it provides so many things for, for young kids and um, opens so many doors for young kids to go out and express themselves. And I think that is what it did for me. Um, like I said, I was always an active kid uh, so sitting in the classroom, you know, for long periods of time, just one cut it for me. Uh, I just need to do something with my energy. And football gave me an outlet to go out there and, and put all my energy into it. 
put all my my anger into it, put everything that you know what I was weighing in weighing down on me, and just put it into the sport. And with football, you have other guys who may feel the same way as you, but you would never you would never know uh, socially until you actually you know get on the team with them, go through practice with them, you know, spend two hours of your day grinding and, and working out and tired and dogged and, and and it really comes out you know where you get to form those bonds and you know build different connections with guys that you never thought you could and i think that football does that you know on a different level than in other sports uh because it really uh you, you can't hide much you know playing football it, it really uh, brings out your heart and it shows you who guys really are and i and it did that for me and i was able to make connections and build friendships that I have to this day with with guys that I've met on my my little league teams or my middle school teams, et cetera. So um, I, I thought it was a great outlet for me. And I, and I know that it's a, a amazing outlet for other kids. Oops, sorry. Uh, when did you when did you realize that you were really good at football, that it could it could be something that could really change your life because you know all kids play sports and they they think they're good i thought i was amazing at basketball then i played wayne ellington and i realized all right maybe i should be talking about the sport not playing it uh when when did you realize that man this this, this sport can really take me far yeah so um i think it was it was in the seventh grade um that's when I first started playing running back. Before that, I played, you know, offensive lineman and I played the defensive line. Um, and I just remember when I was the test, you know, tryout test was running laps or whatever. And I think I, you know, I lapped, you know, a couple of guys that were on the team and I finished early. And we get to our first game and I think I scored like, you know, three touchdowns or whatever. My friend Dion scores three touchdowns. Um, and uh, I don't want to say it was easy, but it just felt like, you know, we were on a, a different level than the other kids. And and I was a fast guy, but I knew there was, you know, other fast, you know, kids out there. And, and I wasn't that fast. But when I saw how uh, how advanced I was at, at that age, um, you know, I was like, man, this is this is something crazy because I, I had never had any you know experience at running back. I just like to run. And I just went out there and basically was just freestyling. And, um, and I saw my friends, you know, getting off as well. And I was like, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is great. I like this feeling and I, and I want this to, to be bigger. I want to build on, you know, what I have here. And um, from, that, from that moment, I don't recall me doubting, you know, my abilities or doubting uh, my ability to, to play the game and to play it at a high level. Um, Man, my dad used to get on my back, try to tell me how to, how you, you got to run like this, you got to do this now, you got to do that, and and I just remember like, all right, I'm gonna do this, and when I did it, you know, he always had something else to do, and so now I find myself competing and, and trying to outdo, you know, whatever critiques he had for me, and um, naturally, man, I just lit a spark under me, and you know, I was just that turned on to like, all right, I'm gonna make sure this game coming up, he's not going to have anything to, to talk about. So obviously he always did. That's probably what dads do. But um, yeah, that that um, that really brought me to the next level. Uh, having a person like that, that was close to me, that I really didn't want to hear, but I, I, I needed it. Having that person motivate you and, and kind of push you, of course, you know, I wanted to show out anytime I had my, my parents come to the games. Um, especially my mom who came to every game. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, kind of show them, you know, this is what I want to do and I'm, I'm serious about it. So I just worked on my, my game and tried to improve on, you know, what I did uh, when I was younger. And that's basically, you know, what got me started and what pushed me and what motivated me. Great. And uh, let me remind everybody in the audience, I don't think I actually mentioned anything in the beginning. If you have any questions for Josh, as we're talking, you know, the last 10, 15 minutes or so, we'll get we'll get to your questions. Just put them right in the comment section and we'll make sure we get to it. Uh, now, Josh, you went to Central Bucks South, I believe, correct? And so you're 
you're you're obviously you're a star athlete there. You like you said, in around seventh grade is when you really started to feel like you were standing out. Uh, yeah. What was what was the experience like at Central Bucks South as a star athlete? I guess maybe the good and the bad. I guess there's probably two sides to the coins in in some instances. I guess maybe people just view you as an athlete and nothing more. Just tell me about your experience uh, in high school. Just being a standout athlete and what that comes with. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I had a great time in high school. Um, you know, I met, you know, a few of my friends that, that I'm still, you know, friends with today um, in the ninth grade, uh, which was, you know, when we had, you know, there was a middle school, Tamlin and, and Unami, and they usually didn't come together until the 10th grade where you meet in high school. Uh, but they canceled, you know, ninth grade sports or whatever. And we all met up in ninth grade. And uh, that was really when I was, you know, starting to make connections with guys outside of my neighborhood. Now we're expanding into different neighborhoods and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I didn't think I was anything, anything special. I just wanted to play ball, um, obviously that's what I was focused on. But, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, in hindsight, you know, I was able to make a, a connections with a lot of people at, at the high school uh, that weren't just on the team. You know, people knew my name. I had never, you know, met them before. Uh, you know, teachers knew, knew who I was. Um, but n none of that really mattered to me. Um, and I don't know how other people, you know, perceived, you know, that, you know, special status or have what have you. But I, I just knew that I was another kid that, that went to the school and I, I just wanted to do the best that I could to get into college and and try to, you know, go to the NFL, like I said. And and that was my mindset. I, I, I thought I was, you know, just like everybody else. Um, I didn't, you know, try to use and abuse, you know, whatever status that I may have had. I just wanted to, you know, play football. And, and that's really always been my mindset. Um, some guys might have abused it. Some guys might have acted differently. But uh, that was never the case for me. Uh, met a lot of great teachers, you know, mm -hmm. support from them. And, and they still support me to this day. Man, especially when, uh, uh, especially when I signed with the Eagles, man, I, I saw my whole community come out. That was, that was so much love. And... Um, you know, I'm not big on, you know, expressing, you know, grand emotions, but that was that was a lot of uh, a lot of love. And uh, I really appreciated it. But, you know, my high school experience was, you know, socially it was it was it was fine. I mean, I had had established friendships and, you know, I was doing well in football. Grades were were up there. So everything that, you know, I was working towards, you know, I was accomplishing those goals that I set for myself and. You know, it was good, um, and I'm sure we'll probably get into this uh, a little bit here. But uh, even through the adversities that I faced, um, you know, the injuries that I've had, you know, it 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 uh, it really didn't stop me at all. And and uh, I had a lot of you know great people around me to help me help me through those things and push me and, and keep me you know, focused on on my dreams and my goals. <clears throat> Cool. Now we'll get to the pro. The we'll get to you know the pro experience in, in a second. But uh, before we get to that, can you take us through your recruiting process? What sold you on Notre Dame? Uh, and, and you know, once you got to Notre Dame, what was that experience like? Because from the outside looking in, it feels like uh, I guess Notre Dame is obviously is a football powerhouse, great tradition. Um, but you know, I you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it's perceived like uh it's a no nonsense school and you know they're really uh they're they're really about their traditions, Catholic and uh so it might be a different experience if you you know, you go to Alabama or, or Penn State or something. How how was the recruiting process? What sold you on Notre Dame? All right. So I'm a you know set the stage a little bit because I remember this. Uh, like it was yesterday. So I got my first offer my sophomore year, um, and I remember what game it was after. Uh, we were playing North Penn, and um, you can look this up. This is crazy. I had, like, negative 12 yards running. Like, 
I wasn't getting anything done. Um, they were a good school in the area. And, and we were, you know, we were pretty hot at that time too. And, I, and that was when I was, you know, growing and, and people really started to uh, recognize my name. And, and I had, you know, a little bit of buzz in the area. Uh, but that game, I just couldn't get it going. Um, had some receptions, but it, I wasn't doing anything major, anything big. Uh, but I took a kickoff back, like like 90 yards or, or what have you. And I just remember it was a foot race the whole time. I was just running past everybody. Um, and that was the only touchdown I had that game. Um, but we ended up winning, and that was like the first time in a couple of years that our school had beat them. And I remember uh, – maybe a week or so goes by and the recruiter from Penn State comes in and he told me, you know, I was at that game and, you know, they were, they were offering me a scholarship. When, when that happened, um, I think I started to, the scholarships, you know, start to like pour in after that moment. Um, so by the time my uh, junior year came around, by the time I finished sophomore year, my junior year came, I had at least, you know, 30 or so offers uh, from different schools and other schools who wanted to, uh, you know, offer me a scholarship, but, you know, they just had to see and wait, whatever whatever that means. But uh, so my junior year came around and uh, Notre Dame came into the picture uh, because my recruiter, who was uh, Coach Heastan, who was the offensive line coach at the time, he coached way back with uh, Dave Rackavan, who was the head coach of, of CB South at the time, um, for Princeton, I believe, way back before I was born. So uh, I don't know that they have a connection, but, you know, in hindsight, I realized, you know, they knew each other and they worked with each other. So I guess he, he put in a good word for me. But uh, they offered me uh, not too long after, you know, the other schools started to offer me. And you know, when, when the guys, you know, for those who don't know, they come in, you know, to your high school, they say, hey, you're, you're a great player. We really love you. We would love to have you on the team. Uh, we think you can be great. I just remember he was he, he, he was talking, you know, different, you know, and, and the stuff he was saying sounded like I could really build off of it. Like it was just more than more than football. Um, I don't know anything about Notre Dame. Him coming into the office is the first I'm hearing about it. I, I never saw Rudy. I never, uh, I, I never, you know, saw the gold helmets. Nothing like that. So, so that's my first introduction to Notre Dame. And and uh, like I said, he was just talking like like he was speaking longevity, and 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 I was with that. I was with all everything that you know. My goals, what I had said, they aligned with what he was talking about. And I just remember, you know thinking it over and uh, I wasn't sure. I was enjoying recruiting. You know, I had all these schools. I was opening the letters, you know, pouring them out, seeing how many how many schools were sending me letters. Uh, so, you know, I was, I was playing it uh, on both sides. But uh, like halfway through my junior year, uh, I tore my ACL uh, and I'm out for the rest of the year. And I just remember that like, Towards the end of the year, I only had at that point like six schools who who were still interested in me, and uh, you know, the rehab process in itself hurt. But like seeing all those other schools, you know, bail out and and kind of go a different way and stop keeping in touch with me, that hurt a little bit too. Um, but me, man, I don't know. Something's <laughs> I'm blessed, but something must be wrong with me because I was like, man, forget them. Like I'm, I was still focused. Like I. I, I didn't I didn't know how else to think. I, I just I knew what I had to get done and I knew that, you know, it was gonna either get done or not, regardless of if I was hurt or if I was injured. So I had to just get past it and um, you know, I just put my emotions aside and, and I said, Hey, I gotta I gotta get this done regardless of what happens. So I got six schools who still like me and uh I'ma see, you know, what those six schools are talking about. And um I remember I took a visit unofficially, of course, uh, before my, my senior year to Notre Dame. Uh, and I took uh, my parents up there and uh, the atmosphere was crazy. Um, I had already been to Penn State. That's a you know, four hour drive. I went there like twice before I went to Notre Dame. Uh, and, and I love that, too. Now, don't get me wrong. But uh, when I went to Notre Dame and that atmosphere was different, like 
like the people in the town, they were genuine, it seemed like. Uh, they were nice people. Uh, the school speaks for itself. And, you know, seeing that football team, I was like, okay, this is, this is what a college football team looks like. You know, the guys were big and they looked faster and they looked stronger and, you know, the whole nine. And, um, you know, of course, my parents got caught, caught up in the hype, uh, obviously. Uh, and it's hard not to uh, because the, the place is great. If you ever get a chance to go up there, anybody, the, the atmosphere is, is really different. Um, and I learned a little bit about the tradition and, and about the legacy, uh, which I hadn't previously known. And I learned a little bit about uh, what it meant to be a Golden Domer. Uh, obviously, you know, the education was a big thing academically. I knew that that would set me up. Um, if this football thing didn't work out, it, it would set me up and put me in a good position to still be able to uh, provide for my family and, and use the connections and, that I made with different people to go out there and, and uh, you know, still be successful. But I just knew that that was the place that, you know, in football that I would go and uh, I would, you know, try to perfect my craft. Uh, so I remember, um, his name was Tony Offer. He was the running back coach at the time. You know, the, the visit is done, you know, what have you. And he told me, he was, he, he told me, he said, Hey, uh, we want you back here, you know, for your official visit. I said, all right, I'm there. So the official visit comes around and he, and he told me, he said, we want you on this team and we want you to commit right now. My parents are, my parents are in the room and I said, okay, uh, I'm going to think about it. And so I told him I would think about it right to his face uh, because I'm not a person that that'll make, um, you know, a rash judgment just based off emotion and based off of uh, because I'm hyper and, and uh, you know, I'm high off of the experience. Uh, I was never that, that type of person. I had to think about it. I had to make sure that that was the choice that I wanted to make, not because, you know, I felt like he was, you know, pushing me and, and try to, convinced me to do it at that at that time and my parents would they left me and my parents alone this is like interrogation man they like good cop bad cop my parents were like hey you need to you need to go ahead and take this like <laughs> like they were offering me like all this money and you know which they were that's 40 for 40 but you know i told both of them i said hey uh this is where i'm gonna spend the next four years of my life and where i'm gonna grow into a, a young man this decision needs to be mine and and uh Respectfully, of course, I, I told him that I'm not going to uh, commit here. So uh, I told him that, and I think he was surprised, and I think he was shocked because he could tell I was enjoying it and having fun, but he really thought that I was going to commit on the spot like you know other guys had done in the past. Uh, so I think I got home. I thought about it. Two, three days gone had gone by, and I, I didn't you know get in contact with him. Um, so when I finally called them, I remember I was at the dealership getting my oil changed and um, or getting my, my sister's car oil changed. It wasn't my car. I didn't have a car at the time. But uh, and I called him. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to commit. I'm going to commit right now. Uh, and I was just standing outside the dealership and he you know, seemed shocked or, or whatever, because I was, you know, I guess he thought I was playing the game if I wasn't interested. And you know I was playing hard to get or whatever, and uh, and I commit on that on that spot. And after that, I hadn't visited another school. And I remember that next week I had an official visit set up with Stanford, and um, which is another great school academically. And I knew that you know it was good to have that in my pocket. And um, I never went out to Stanford until we played them. And, uh, you know, maybe I should have, have taken a trip just because I knew I was going to Notre Dame anyway. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. It didn't, you know, really matter to me. But I remember coming to Notre Dame that day, and, um, you know, the rest was history. I had myself a great senior year. Um, quick story before we, before we get off the subject. We were – my senior year, we were playing Garnet Valley in the playoffs. And uh, I was hurt the game before, and that was for our district title. So I really wanted to play that game because I wanted to get, you know, Central Bucks a district title. And, um, man, I just couldn't do it. I sprained my ankle. I, I couldn't walk on that thing. And, and I just remember watching the game, and it was so close. We almost won, and we, we were right there, and we lost. 
man, I, I was so mad, man. I was so hot. And I had already committed to Notre Dame. I had already set up my future. But what mattered to me was at that moment in playing, I was invested in in that moment. And I was I was the first one in the locker room, man. I was, you know, I was mad. I was punching the wall. And one of the guys, he came up to me. He was like, hey, man, like, like you going to Notre Dame. Like, why are you, why are you mad? Like, we have to play off next week. You know, we lost this one game, but it, it really doesn't matter. And I was like, man, I'm I'm not at Notre Dame. I don't I don't care about that right now. I wanted this game right here. And and like I said, that connection is so strong that you make with uh, the guys on your team that you want them to win as well, and you want them to succeed, and you just want to see what's see them do great. And to not be able to go out there and fight with them and and uh, and go to battle with them, um, it hurts because you're so emotionally invested in it. And uh, I remember just being so mad at that point that nothing else really mattered. Um, so we go to play Garnet Valley and I'm playing on like half an ankle and, you know, we just we couldn't get it done. And that was the end of my, my high school career. And I still look back on it to this day, even even being in the NFL, playing, you know, making money and, and being able to, you know, live out my dream. I still look back on that day like, man, I wish we just could have could have won that because you don't get that stuff back, man. You don't you don't get those times back with with the guys that, you know, you grew up with and, you know, you grew up playing ball with and um, even college, man. I, I still remember that day right there. And, uh, you know, that was a that was a special, uh, special time. But, you know, it, it was experiences and uh, I loved it and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the experience with the guys. But to this day, I still remember that. But you know, you know that was a little tangent. But but uh, Notre Dame, yeah, uh, Notre Dame was 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 a school for me. Uh, I just I just knew I I, I could get there, and and I, that's just where I saw myself. Yeah, and then just one quick thing on Notre Dame. Once you got there, and you know, went through your years there, was it everything that it lived up to be? And did you you know enjoy enjoy that experience? You know, on the field and off the field. Yeah, no. I mean, Notre Dame was good for me. I mean, I had a great experience. I I, I can't complain about about. <laughs> I'm gonna complain about one thing. I'm gonna complain about one thing. So my freshman year. So you know, you see college on TV. You see it on uh, you know different channels, and they have this picture painted of what college is supposed to be. Um, man, in the summer, so all the athletes get there, and we stay in the dorms together with the other football players. So I'm like, okay, I can, I can do this. The dorms are nice, you know, it's, it's cool. We get to the fall semester, where they have the football players integrated with the rest of the students, and uh, I remember getting to my dorm. My dorm was the size of my closet. I am not kidding. There was another kid in there with me. It was two guys sharing the closet. Man, I wanted to leave at that moment. Like. I called, I remember calling my coach. I'm like, hey man, we gotta stay at your house or something. Like, I can't stay here. And I was so disappointed, man. I, <laughs> I was like, man, we just got through a tough camp, you know. Um, we're getting ready to start the season. I'm I'm all settled in, you know, on the football side of things, and and you gotta stand in this closet. That uh you, I can't make that up, man. I, that that room was so small. Um but my roommate was cool, man. He was another quiet kid. And, you know, I, honestly, I wouldn't have made that connection in any other place. Uh, you, uh, well, his name was uh, Aaron. Uh, he was from Florida. Um, so what other place would I have met a random kid like that? If I went somewhere else, I probably Was he would. an athlete? And he wasn't. No, he was just a regular student. Um, just went to the school uh, and I got to learn about him and and it was cool because our, our personalities mess, you know, we talked when we had something to say. And if not, you know, we just sit there and, and vibe. And, and that was great. But um, as far as, you know, athletically, I remember going into the first game and, and I knew I wasn't going to play at all um, because I had two other guys in front of me. We had uh, CJ Prosides and Terry and Folsom. And uh, it was me and, and Dexter Williams who came in together. And, uh, you know, we just didn't figure we were going to play that game. We are playing Texas. And uh, I think, you know, two drives in, uh, Taryn gets hurt uh, and he tore his ACL. So now CJ's up. CJ Prosize is a, a running uh, receiver turned running back. So I don't think the coaches knew what he was going to do. 
We sure didn't know what was going on. We just know one of us is up next if he gets tired. And he went out there and balled, man. And, and sure enough, he got tired. And I went in like on the 10 or 15 yard line. And uh, my first play and first carry was a, a jet sweep and I scored all day. My mom has a picture. That's my first ever touchdown and, and my first play. And um, I mean, that's, that's, that, that was just a blessing, man. I, I, I can't thank God enough for that because I, like I said, I didn't expect to get in that game, man. I, I got my gloves off and I'm just enjoying the atmosphere, um, enjoying the crowd and watching a great game. And, and I went in there and, uh, and uh, it was, you know, downhill ever since or uphill or just not but success since then. And uh, I just, uh, I thank God that I had that experience and it was, it was amazing, man. That, and that really summarized my whole experience at Notre Dame, just that feeling and energy like that and just nothing but love. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a great time there. Well, wow, touchdown on your first touch. I'm surprised your coach didn't move you into his house right after that. <laughs> man, I wish he did. He <laughs> Um, so before we get to the questions, uh, you know, we can't just gloss over. So you have a decorated career at Notre Dame, obviously, uh, one of the best running backs in the country. Uh, you get a chance to play in the NFL. How has that experience been? Of course, I remember you played for, you know, your hometown, hometown Philadelphia Eagles and most recently the New York Jets. How has the how has that process been and what's changed? a little bit knowing that it's not just a game for you anymore. It's a business. It's your livelihood. You have to make sound decisions uh, just to keep a paycheck coming every week. Yeah. So talk about a business, man. So like, like you said, uh, I had a great, you know, experience at Notre Dame, um, did my thing, you know, put up the numbers, what have you. So I left uh, my junior year. I just knew that uh, I had given everything that I had and, and I just felt it in my body. I couldn't give no more, man. I, I just, you know, felt like I gave in my heart and I put everything out there and I was just ready to, to make the transition. I always knew that I would, you know, go back to school and get my degree, of course, uh, because that's just what I had my heart set out on. And I knew that I would be able to do that in, uh, when I get to the NFL. I could go back and just get it done again. I'm not thinking about how the time, you know, schedules pan out and, and what do I have to move aside? I'm just thinking that I have to get it done. So, um, so I leave as a junior, and um, I, I just know, man, I, I'm I'm getting drafted. Like somebody's gonna pick me up after the year I I had, I, and I knew, man, that the guys coming out of my class, I knew that I could compete with the best, and I was up there with them. Uh, but um, I come out and I'm preparing for the combine. I'm getting ready. Um, like I said, I had the ACL my junior in high school and I wore a knee brace. Um, so with that, it has its own stigma. Everybody assumes that you just got hurt uh, when you wear the knee brace and I wore it every year. You know, I wasn't taking any chances. I was gonna make sure I was good and set and um, I'm wearing the knee brace. I don't care what nobody says because I want to protect myself. So I come out and that was like the number one question in all of my, my combine interviews. Uh, you know, is, is your knee okay, is your knee good? My knee's cool. I just wear the brace, you know. Uh, so we get to uh, the bench day, so where we have the bench press. And that was the same day as our medical reviews. So we have to, you know, get checked out by all the doctors in the NFL. All 32 teams have to look at you. I do the bench. Um, I had, you know, prepared for it. I got like 19 or 20 reps, which was, was good for me. You know, uh, 20 reps, and that's average, you know, for the running back. So I wasn't trying to, you know, break any records or blow anybody away with that. But I knew that that next day when we get out there and do the drills that I was going to kill it. So I'm in the medical drills. I mean, a medical uh, review in my last day or my last station. There were like six or seven stations that you have to go to. It's the whole day. My last station, I get past everybody. And uh, I told them that I had uh, sprained my ankles in high school. So if you if you tell them anything that's wrong with you, they have to check you out. I should have just said I was good, but what kid hasn't sprained the ankle, you know, once or twice? So uh, they look at, you know, my, my ankle and they found, uh, you know, a small little fracture in my foot. And I'm like, OK, that's just a little fracture. I'm good, you know. But uh, so that gets me red flag, which means I can't compete uh, in the drills the next day. 
when they said that, man, I'm looking at all the guys again that that I came out with, all the guys that I that I can compete against, and now I can't because of you know this small little detail. And I had felt great training. I had felt great, you know, leaning up to the point. Um, but as that happens, as I don't do the the drills, it's already you know running in my head like, okay, my agent told me you know if this happens. And I got a you know pretty solid agent now. He's he's a great guy. But he you know prepared me for you know if this happens then this and if that then that. So he prepared me for you know all the situations. And sure enough, you know what he told me that would happen. It, it definitely happened. Um, I got red flagged, and uh, you know that that hurt my stock a little bit. Uh, so come the draft day, I'm sitting there. I'm watching all the guys get drafted. You know it was great seeing you know some of my teammates get drafted. I'm happy for them. I'm excited. Um, so I'm on the second day, which is the third or fourth round. And, uh, you know, the names are just getting called They keep getting called. I'm, I'm, I'm moving back and back. I'm sitting there with my family and my friends, man. And, uh, and my name was not getting brought up. We're getting close to the sixth or seventh round and my name is still not getting called. So by the time the sixth round comes around, I, I know it's bad for me because like I said, ain't no way I'm getting, you know, draft six or seven. I know I'm better than these guys. There's no way. Uh, but I go undrafted. And I just remember we're on, like, the last two picks of the draft. And uh, I knew I wasn't getting drafted. But it didn't hit me until the whole thing was finally over. And they ended the show. And uh, I just broke down, man. I started crying. And uh, because this is my dream, this is what I had dedicated my whole life to do. This is what I, I made sacrifices for. I just knew that I had to get drafted to go to the NFL. That's what I thought. And I didn't get drafted at all. And uh, it, it just, you know, broke broke me a little bit uh, at the moment. Um, but, you know, I was still blessed, man. God, God always has a plan. And uh, not too long, you know, my agent called me, told me, you know, these few teams are interested in you. And uh, as soon as he said Philly, I, I said, you know what, all right, that's that's where I'm going. I'm, I'm going back home, and uh, I, I'm going to do it for the city, man. And, and I told my parents, I said, I'm coming back home. And uh, and that was that, man. I was excited. I didn't know what to expect. I just knew, man, this this chip on my shoulder couldn't get any bigger because uh, everything that I had been to previously and what had just happened to me, um, I knew that was enough to to get me through the door and to and to motivate me and get this thing done. So uh, we go to the training camp. I missed the rookie mini camp because of uh, my prior injury to my foot. Uh, but once camp comes around, man, I, I went out there full full steam and uh, I didn't hold anything back. I had a lot to improve on, obviously, but uh, I wanted to prove to everybody that that I belonged here and this is what. Uh, what it's going to be and I wanted to get my name out there in front of the coaches and, and show them that that I belong there and not only that I belong but I was one of the best that that was coming in um and that was a battle in itself man that that was tough and you talk about a business man they got guys that that they like they have guys that they brought in the guys that they drafted um because they didn't draft me if they really wanted me there they would have drafted me uh, but you know, I was basically like the tryout, the tryout guy with the other guys that got brought in and, and uh, as a um, free agent. So I knew that I still had something to prove to them, even though that I was on you know the preseason team. You know that doesn't mean I made the team. So I was battling not only against the other guys, I was battling to get recognized by the coaches against the other teams that we would play. Um, and I just remember, man, I, there was days that I just wanted to quit. I, I remember this one day I had a full body cramp and I almost quit football that day. I, I can't make this up, man. I almost stopped playing because that was crazy. I'm not going to, you know, share the details, but um, my whole body went through it that day. And I was like, man, I'm not coming back in tomorrow. I, I promise you I'm not. Sure enough, I woke up 630. I was in the building. Um, in the hot tub, getting ready for the practice. I'm, I man, that's that's God moving my feet. I don't know how I made it in that building because I definitely wanted to give up. But, but again, in the back of my mind, I knew, man, it, it's nobody else that's going to do this for me. Like, you got to yeah. be the one to, to get up and do it. Nobody's going to hold your hand. So, you know, go ahead and, and do what needs to be done. So, I just went right back out there. And those coaches was all were always on my case about 
being in shape, you know, finishing, finishing, finishing. That's and that's something that I was used to. But at this level, uh, there was just you know a little bit more pressure, um, and I was taking all the reps. So you know, I'm they got the guy who's starting. They have their guys that they want. Those guys are going to get their rest. You know, this guy that we just brought in, we'll get him some reps. So I was taking all of them. Um, <laughs> so they was they were really working me, and uh, I just remember that uh the preseason games man i was i was i was doing good i got i wasn't you know anything too crazy but i was definitely you know putting myself out there and i was showing them that i belonged and and of course in my opinion you know i think that you know i'm the guy that needs to to be there you know you can cut somebody else but that last preseason game ends and they cut me but in the back of my mind i knew i would be back or somewhere on somebody's team, I would be back because of what I just did in that preseason and what I've shown and, and how I view myself and, and what I believed. And uh, so I, they bring me back on the practice squad and I continue to go hard against whoever they put out in front of me. Um, I, I really didn't care who was, who was up against me. And uh, I probably sat on the practice squad for, for two weeks. And uh, the third game I was active because of, uh, injuries and that's just how you know your opportunities come you got to take them how you get them and and that was how mine came and and I remember that uh, in practice man I, I was just balling and and again I was you know fighting two battles I had to play the team and I had to play the coaches so I remember the coaches uh, you know they were like we didn't draft this guy he's still got a lot to prove we don't know if we want to put him out there yet and my running back coach Deuce uh, he he really fought for me, man. He he told him like, nah, that like Josh needs to play. Like in some way, you know, put him, give him a package or something. Like we need to get him out there. And uh, sure enough, I got I got a package. Like I got one play, and uh, I remember it was like a, a toss or or something. And I went 15 yards for it. And and since then, uh, you know, I, I really got more opportunities, and they started to give me more looks, and uh, and that's when um when I really got in a, as you say, fair position to, you know, fight for that spot because our starting running back was hurt. So um, you know, I fought every week and eventually I was, I was named the starter. Uh, and even then, again, you know, I had somebody in my corner fighting for me saying, no, this guy's better. So he needs to, you know, be the starter. And uh, that's how I became the, the starter. And uh, man, that was crazy, man. Like if, if you're from Philly, you know, you know, Philly fans, like they're, they're the wildest, while it's out there and um yeah it's hard to please them so i'm from philly i already know so i'm gonna just go out there and do me and i'm gonna i know how to play and let them do them you just gotta know how to how to deal with them so i just went out there and did me um i thought you know i did pretty well my rookie year uh I get hurt um i think into my like third or second start and i uh I hurt my shoulder i tore my labrum and end up playing the rest of the season uh, with a torn labrum, and uh, I was I went through so much pain with that thing, man. But again, like you said, it's a business. I got to get out there and produce so that I can continue to um, continue to play. I mean, if they take me out, I may never get the chance again. So I gotta I gotta produce and, and make it happen. So I played the rest of the the season with a torn labrum, and I remember uh, I didn't play. Uh, against uh, New Orleans when we went back there. No, I didn't play against Chicago. I got one carry in Chicago, and and um, and I wasn't playing because I was hurt, and the co the coach eventually found that out, and I couldn't hide it anymore, and they were like, okay, you know, we got to protect this guy and look after him. Uh, so I still suited up, but I didn't play. And I snuck out there for one play because one of the backs, you know, he was tired, and he ran off, and nobody went in, so I just ran in. and. Uh, I mean, I, I got to, you know, get mine where I can. So I went out there. I, I don't know what the coach's reaction to it was, but I'm out there now and I got one carry. Um, but I know I didn't play against New Orleans uh, the next week uh, because I just couldn't, man. I was I was going through a lot of pain and I, I need to get this thing taken care of. So um, the next year. I remember. Year, I remember, yeah. man. Those were the playoff games, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember. I just had a full circle moment. I don't want to go on a tangent, but – I just remember because he obviously grew up an Eagles fan and self-admittingly, I'm not a huge college football guy, you know, just 
Philly, Philly is like big time basketball and there was no like local college in the area of Philadelphia that like enticed me to cheer. The closest Penn State and I don't really have any connection to that. So I don't pay as much attention to college football. Uh, so where I remember is like when I think it was week three or whatever, when you're activated, like I heard the guys on the broadcast, they're like, yeah, he's a Philly guy, hometown hero. And I remember, vividly remember looking you up like, who's, he's from Philly. Oh, that's what's up. And now I'm on a call with you and, you know, I'm on a board with your mom. So it's just funny how, how life works. Um, now, before we get to the questions, I just, I have to ask you one more question because uh, this is so important. You are building a park or yeah, you're building a park or correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, back in your hometown. It's such an admirable, admirable thing to do with your hard earned money. Tell me why that is so important to you and a little bit about that project. Yeah, so I'm I'm rebuilding the park. The park is there already, but we're we're tearing it down and, and putting a new one in there. Um, so that was something that I had always, you know, thought about. You know, what am I passionate about? What can I do to to give back to the community? Uh, I really learned that uh, while I was with the Eagles because you know we would do different community events, and I remember we went out to the school and. Uh, you know, the school in uh, West Philly, and we helped paint, you know, the, the walls of, of the school and we helped, you know, them build a new park. And it was it was pretty good. It was it was a dope, uh, dope thing that we were doing. Um, and since then, that's why I was like, OK, I need to you know get back into the community and give what I can. Uh, so I've been donating to uh, the homeless shelters uh, down in South Philly. Uh, what I do is I just I go out and I buy a bunch of things, uh, you know, preferably during the winter. Uh, where I can buy, you know, uh, gloves, hats, you know, covers, you know, socks, uh, different stuff like that. And I just get a bunch of it and I just drop it off and leave. Uh, so, you know, and they appreciated it. And that's how I've been giving back to Philly. But um, it wasn't until I would say a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, um, you know, I thought, how can I give back to, to my community directly uh, where I grew up, uh, where I went to school? How can I give back to that area? And I remember, you know, I, I spent days and nights at that park. And I remember as a kid, they were always talking about, you know, uh, rebuilding and, and getting new things installed in there. But for some reason, we just never got it done. And um, I never knew why. I didn't know why that we couldn't just have the city fund the money and, and just, you know, build us a new basketball court or get us a, a, a new playground in there. I, I never really looked into it. And um, it was while I went back uh, to school while I was in uh, Notre Dame getting my degree. And I just did a little bit of research and it just started off like as an email. I, I just emailed um, the park representatives of, of the township and I uh, just emailed the township people saying, hey, I, I got an idea that I want to run by you guys. Is it cool that we meet and talk about it and see if we can get this thing going? And um, you know, and they were great. They got back to me, Andy, um, and he got back to me. He said, "Hey, yeah, we can talk about it." So I got on the call with him. I said, "Hey, this is what I'm thinking. I, I think we can get it done." Um, and at that time, you know, as the time went on, I kind of thought about how I could, on my end, uh, get these things going and what I was going to do. So my original plan was, "Hey, um, I don't know how I'm gonna get it done. I don't know where I'm gonna get the money, but I'm already two and a half years in. I'll just..." I'll just fund the whole thing myself. You know, I'm not even thinking. I just I'm thinking like let's just get the let's just get it done. Let's get the park done. Um, so after talking with them and, and after getting some some insight on you know the parks that they build in the community and and really how the process works, I and I thought you know I need a little bit more help on this. I I can't just you know throw money at it and have that be the answer. So um, so after you know getting informed. Uh, you know, I, I get in contact with my, my team um, and, and I partner with with Common Bonds to to see if we can really make this a reality, see if we can really get this thing going, because I was passionate about being able to go out and play. I was passionate about um, being a, a better example for uh, the youth, uh, because when I was growing up, we didn't have any anybody that was in my position to set, set an example and be a positive role model. So, you know, I, I thought, hey, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be the standout. I'm going to be that guy to show them that, you know, you can do these things and you can give back to the community and um, still have pride for, for where you where you're from, even if you 
you know, make it to the big stage. So I uh, partnered with uh, Common Bonds and, uh, you know, we went, went at it uh, running. We really got um, everything in place. You know, we stay in contact with uh, the township and um, we've come out, come out with a, a great model on uh, how to rebuild the park. Uh, pretty much everything in there is going to be new. Um, right now, our process is is rolling, and uh, we should start uh, production in the summer, and it should be finished. Uh, hope, hopefully, that you know COVID is is out the way, and uh, you know social distancing is is limited. Hopefully, we can get started with uh, within October, November uh, of the upcoming year. Um, but again, everything is new. We're going to take the basketball court out. We're going to take the playground out. Put a new one in there. Uh, we're going to put a 40-yard dash in. Um, there's going to be an obstacle course. Uh, we're going to take down uh, the, the fences that are around the basketball basketball court and just make it open so that it has more of an open feel. And what we're doing is we're partnering with um, local community outlets. So they'll be, you know, helping us, you know, raise the money and fund the money for the park. And we're really trying to have the, the whole community involved. Uh, we're talking about doing a community build so that uh, the people within a community can feel a part of what we're building and, and feel like that they own you know, the park as well, that it just doesn't belong to one person. And when they go out and play, that they can be proud of you know, what they've built and, and uh, the product that, that they're able to play on. And they can have some pride uh, within the area, um, which is a you know, quick backstory the areas is a, a lower economic area. You know, it's mainly minority uh, driven area. And um, the park has, has been worn down since since I've been playing on it. And, I, and I've been playing on it since I was six or seven. So that's that's a long time for, for one spot to be uh, worn down. So um, I thought now was a better time than any, especially with uh, the pandemic, uh, getting a, being able to get kids back outside and being able to play and, and uh, and have fun and, and really release that energy that's been built up and uh, putting something positive out there, not just seeing negativity everywhere that they look, just being able to get out there and, and be a kid again. So it was something that I was passionate about. And again, just how I was, how I'm building, I'm just thinking, you know, we can get it done regardless of what happened. So, um, so yeah, I'm excited. I'm actually excited about it. And um, I, I can't wait till we actually start because then, then I know, okay, like uh, the, the finished product is almost here. Uh, so I'm excited to have the different outlets be a part of it. I'm excited to have the community be a part of it, to have different people um, support and to speak on behalf of the park is amazing. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to have this conversation and have this discussion about it because uh, I can't wait for everybody to be a part of it because I wanna bring in you know, surrounding communities to the park as well. I don't want it just to be um, just for, you know, my neighborhood. I want everybody to be proud of it. So uh, it's, it's a big deal for me and uh, I can't wait till, you know, till we're done and, and the finished product is there. Awesome, man. Yeah, that'll definitely be a place that'll create a lifetime of memories for generations of kids and you know how big that is. Uh, let's get to the questions, man. This was a great conversation. We'll start with uh, John Duke. Um, Josh, do you believe sports teams help break down barriers or differences in race, religion, and cultures? If so, how or why? And when does it stop and those differences become a factor to bonding slash connecting as equals? Yeah, I definitely think that um, that it does. Uh, at all phases of it, um, Pee Wee, uh, high school, um, college, and and the pros, I think that there's a common understanding between all the people, and there's a common goal between everybody. That um, you know, we're one now. We're on this team, and and we have a common goal. I mean, if you know anything about the sport, it, you're with those guys more time than you're with your actual family. So. You're spending all your time with those guys and learning about them and learning about who they are. And all of you will have differences. Um, but again, like the more that you grind it out with these these people and the more that you, you know, go through war with these people, as some say, um, 
you you realize that it, it, it doesn't matter. We're we're all here human. We're all hurting the same, and and we all you know love this game. And, and the love for the game is is what brings people together. Um, because the more you're around somebody, you you want them, you want the best for them because they become like a part of your family or or a part of um, a part of your group, and and they have an effect on you. They have an effect on on your growth. So you don't want to disrespect your family. You know, families fight, obviously, but and you're going to fight with these guys and you're going to have differences. But at the end of the day, you realize that we're all the same and we're all here for the, for the same reasons. And um, actually, you're able to talk about those differences openly. And it's not like, um, you know, just, just chaotic and we're just all throwing different things at each other. And, you know, I disagree with you and we're yelling at each other. No, we're actually working through this because we have to get back out there together and we have to be able to trust each other. So we're gonna have to get through it one way or another and we're gonna have to reach uh, equal ground. And I think that um, obviously there are always outliers of, of, of different guys who just don't wanna mesh at all in all uh, areas of the game. But I don't think it ever stops, you know, building bonds and connections. Um, even in NFL, how um, business-like it is and, and people say that it's more of a business than it is a game. I think that on the outside, uh, people try to divide and and not make it seem like the the guys are united, and especially you know with political issues. But at the end of the day, the guys uh, are you know still connected and, and still have ties because, like I said, we we have to get out there and be able to trust you uh, and able to do, in order to do our job. So I have to be able to find um, a commonality between the two of us to get it done, and that and that doesn't matter what race, religion, or ethnicity you are, we have to, you know, find some some equal ground to play on. And um, I think once it's out there past, you know, football, that's when things get complicated. But I think that within the sport, uh, it definitely does the job. Great question. Yeah, beefing with your lead blocker is bad for business for sure. I don't want to um, do that. <laughs> uh, this is from Tama. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Forgive me if I didn't. Hi, Josh. I'm curious. The NFL did a lot of publicity about the Inspire Change initiative. As a player, what do you think about these initiatives and do they make a difference? How are they promoted by individual teams? P.S. Love your touchdown against the Patriots. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the Inspire Change is, is something that the NFL is doing against um, social and racial injustice. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really to help better inform the people that are watching uh, to fight for equality and to fight against injustice. And um, I think that anytime the NFL does something, they have to try to find a way that all 32 teams can um, do it equally and that make sure that all 32 teams are included. So um, you hear all the stories about um, how one owner feels this way, the other owner feels that way. I think that the Aspire Change, uh, like I said, was a common ground where they could all come together and say, okay, um, obviously what's happening in our country can't be ignored, but we have to say something. So what can we all agree on and what can we all put out there to promote and inspire change? And, um, and I think that what they came up with was not only the NFL on, on their behalf, but of the players um, stepping up and using their voice uh, to try to get out front in front of that and, and try to have their voice be heard, which is a lot is something that we're hearing a lot of now uh, of players really using their platform for good and, and for positivity and, and trying to really uh, get the issue out there and come up with a solution. So I think that um, that initiative is, is only the start really uh, to something bigger and to something better and to um, really have inclusion within the community of uh, of the country because the NFL is just a, a microcosm of, of the country. Everything that happens within a country happens within the NFL. And uh, I don't think that that side of the league is shown a lot, but um, I think this is really opening the doors to the fans to get an inside look at the players and to you know, show them that the players are, are people too. We're not just you know faces with a name, and we're not just making uh, this money to look you know fancy or whatever. We have feelings, and we have families, and this is our story. So I think that 
um, that's what the Inspire Change initiative is. And I think that it will grow uh, from there. Uh, I think you're muted a little bit. God, a rookie mistake all, yeah. all day. Um, so Tim, this is from Tim. You've been on a lot of teams at a lot of levels. How does the locker room dynamic change as you progress, such as having some NFL hopefuls versus people ending their football careers in college or having business decisions and players growing families? How does all that impact NFL locker rooms, basically with people in all different phases of life? Yeah, so um, excuse me. Um, the locker room dynamic is, is is really weird. I think it's from from high school to college. I think it's pretty much the same. There's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of connection and bonding with the guys um, on your team. The NFL is definitely different, and I think that this is where the business and where the evolution comes into the game is. You have these guys, I come into the league and I'm 21 years old and there's a guy that's 30 and he has like two kids, a wife, and he has a whole house like 30 minutes away from uh, from the facility. So uh, it's hard to build connections with, with somebody who already has a family and you're just getting started in your journey. Um, so what can we find that, that will connect both of us? Um, in college, it's easy. We're all either you're – a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. You can't really get past any of that. So I know you're not too old. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you look the part, they're, they're still within your age range. So um, uh, so uh, in the NFL, is definitely different because you have grown men out there who have uh, kids and who have families to look after. And, and you're literally coming out of college and you have that you know college responsibility of I'm still free to do what I want and you know, live life and go explore and, and this and that. So um, it's hard to, to build connections in, in NFL locker rooms. It really is um, because these are guys that you're competing with, you're making money. And if you beat that guy out, uh, he, he might get off the team. And now that's his family that that he has to provide for. Uh, so it's tough for, for guys to be genuine and to be honest with each other, because at the end of the day, you have to get a job done. You have to provide for your family. So I don't really care about the other guy's feelings at the end of the day. I have to provide for my family. Um, but as a rookie, and that's really how, how I was thinking, uh, as I grow and as I you know continue to get my years in, I, I just realized that I'm, I'm blessed to play this game. And I said I would always be here, and I said I would get here, and I, and I did. Um, if I stop playing tomorrow, I want to make sure that that practice or that game, uh, I give it the best that I can give and I give it my all and I put my heart into it because again, I, I made a plan to invest in my future when I decided to go to Notre Dame. And uh, I know that if this football thing ends tomorrow, that I'm, I'm going to be fine. Um, I won't have anything to worry about. Uh, I'll still be able to do what I'm passionate about. I'll still be able to stay connected to the game. I just won't be able to play anymore. Uh, so that's how I look at it is, it's a job, but I'm going to still go out here and have fun. I'm going to still try to make a positive connection with the other guys on the team, and I'm not you know, going to try to have it stress me out too much. Your rookie year, you're going to be stressed out. It's no getting past it. But once you get past that hump and once you get past the introduction, uh, you're really, really able to think about your life and calm down and, and really um, think about your future and, and how you want to grow into a man. And um, that's what I've been doing, and I've been trying to – you know, open myself up more to the guys in the locker room and try to build those connections. So uh, it's definitely harder in the league, but um, but I, I think that in all phases, you're able to build some some sort of connection. Awesome. Um, this is from Patricia Scott. Josh, you often hear professional athletes reminisce about their high school and college days being a, being a highlight for them, even though they are now professional and at the peak of their careers. I just heard you state something similar. What is it about those younger years that is so special and impacting? Um, yeah, I, I think I think it is that when you're younger, your body's more durable. Uh, you're you're able to take in more. You have limited responsibilities. I mean, you have your parents that have to take care of you, so you don't have to worry about providing for yourself. So you're able to go out there and have fun and and not worry about the consequences. Um, which you do ultimately, but that's not how you think at a young age. So when you play the game, you're playing, you know, um, 
all gas and no break and and you're just doing whatever you want to do and um i think that when that becomes a part of your memory you think back to those days of man like i was really out there with that much energy and i was really doing whatever i wanted to do and um and you just remember those being great times because now man your body hurts you wake up stiff um <laughs> you work out and it takes you longer to recover and your age you know sort of catches up to you a little bit um because as an NFL player, man, the, the stuff that you put your body through, like you're equal to to a 50 year old man almost. But uh, but that's why you know sports medicine has come into the game, and and guys are able to last longer because they're taking better stuff and taking care of their nutrition and stuff like that. So it's a little different, but but again, it, it does uh, put a toll on on you. And when you look back at when you were younger, uh, you realize that you were able to do a lot more of these things. Uh, without trying um when i was younger i could just get up and go i didn't need to stretch or anything so now i, I gotta get a good stretch in and, and make sure that i'm taking care of my body because i'm older now and uh you just want those days back man you just want to go out there and be a young bull and um you can't get it back so i think that's why guys uh i think that's why guys reminisce on their younger days and why they love uh talking about the high school experiences because um you know they were able to do that Nice. All right. This is from Todd. Josh, I've watched you since you went to South with my daughter. You've always been a class act on and off the field. Today just reconfirms that for me. What would be your one key piece of advice you can share that keeps you grounded and focused that we can share with today's youth or even use to help focus ourselves when we stray from our course in life? Yeah, I don't think there is. Um there's one thing in particular, uh, everybody's different, but I will say that um, because what worked for me might not work for the next guy, but I will say that if you have a dream and you have a goal that you have your heart set out on, um, go go accomplish it, man. Don't, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. But along those same lines, you have to dedicate yourself and you might have to make some sacrifices uh, in order to, to get there and to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And it's it's not going to be pretty at days. It's, it's going to be hard. You're going to look around you and other guys aren't doing the same thing. And um, it looks like you're missing out on a lot of fun, but that's just what's necessary to, to achieve your, your goals and your dreams. Because for my example, when you talk about the NFL is, I don't know, it's less than 3% or 2% of the population make it to play at that, at that stage. So if you want to be in that percentage, you're going to have to, do something big and make some some big sacrifices in order to do that. So um, you just do it, man. You got to stay grounded. Have you have your family and have you know supporters around you to to keep you focused. Um, stay grounded in, in in your morals and values, and, and just make sure that at the end of the day, when you wake up, you re you remember that I have this dream and this goal. How am I going to accomplish that today, or how am I going to do it today? Everybody messes up. You're going to stumble along the way. Uh, just make sure that you just don't lose sight of of why you started, and and if you do, it's going to be you put in all that work, and you just gave up on it. So you basically wasted all that time. Make sure you put your time to good use. Uh, that would be my advice, just to keep on keep on fighting, stay in a good fight. Um, that's really the difference between me and a lot of other guys. Is there has there have been other guys that are, are more talented to me, work better at at the position. Um, but dedication and, and perseverance is, is definitely uh, key aspects to getting over that hump of of making it versus versus not making it. So great, and uh, I believe this is the last question, Trevor. Uh, in dealing with injuries, the highs and lows of life, business opportunities, and family, how do you take care of your mental health as a pro athlete? Has this ever been an intentional discussion at the high school, collegiate, or pro level? Yeah, so I don't think that um, not not too many people get into uh, the mental health aspect of of sports and uh, of athletics, honestly. Um, and that's something that I've, I've just uh, learned how to deal with and just learned how to um, balance uh, maybe a year ago, um, because in high school and middle school and college, um, college is really where it started because I started to get more stress and and my dreams started to become more of a reality the closer I got. 
And I think that's when life kicked in and was like, I'm, I'm actually going to do this. And I, and all these worries pop into my head. Um, and I didn't know how to manage it because it never happened uh, to me before. Uh, and a lot of athletes are like that, especially in the NFL. And, and that's something that, you know, the media and people really don't talk about. I think now they're, they're getting into the, the subject more. And that's that's great for the sport. And that's great for other sports. And I think that's going to uh, open a lot of doors. Um, but I think that having somebody to talk to uh, is 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 the first step. Just whoever it is, it doesn't always have to be professional help. Um, that definitely will come later along down the lines uh, if needed. But just having like somebody who who will listen to you, uh, judgment free, being able to hear uh, hear your pain and, and and hear your feedback, and um, and that's the first step because a lot of times these guys don't have the ability to share and open up and and to share their emotions because they feel like they have nobody to talk to. They don't want to stress out their family because they're providing for them. They don't want to stress out their friends because they don't want to seem masculine or or seem like they can't handle it. And that's the biggest uh, thing with, with men is, um, you know, we think that we, we can't try, we, we think that we can't share our emotions because it'll make us seem weaker, uh, which is, is, is really wrong. Um, I think that when guys start to open up more, that's really how you begin the process of dealing, um, uh, dealing with, you know, your emotions and dealing with uh, your stress and anxiety and, and and your panic attacks and what have you, examples like that. Um, just being able to talk to somebody and, and really not being uh, too macho to get professional help, man. Sometimes it is needed to, to see somebody and, and to talk through your issues because a lot of that stuff was covered up when you were focused on trying to accomplish your dreams. So you might have to, you know, think back on to why you're, you know, so tense and so stressed up. And um, I, I think that the NFL, while it isn't out there, you know, big, it, it, they are taking the steps to make sure that the athletes are, are getting help. Um, I think, I don't know if it's all 32 teams, but I think that some teams have a psychologist and, and have a therapist on site with the team. Um, the next step is actually getting those guys to go in there because uh, you can't make them. Uh, you can only suggest it for them. But uh, I, I think that the more that guys go in there, other guys will follow. And the more that it's out there and it's normalized to to say that it's okay to get help and it's okay to uh, have mental stability, I think that more guys will go in there and and try to seek help that they can uh, for their mental state. But uh, that is something that I, I've just learned how to deal with and being more open and, and trying to you know talk more about how I'm feeling and, and my problems uh, because I didn't get here by myself, so I don't have to take it all on you know on my own. So I think that's. Uh, something that you know I, I can do better at, obviously, but I think that is uh, something that a lot of guys struggle with, and nobody really knows that. So I, I'm glad that guys are stepping up and sharing their stories. Great stuff. And we actually have one more question. It is a great question to end on. It's from Jacqueline. Uh, she said, "Josh, you've spoken a lot about your football accomplishments, but what are you most proud of outside of that?" Um. <laughs> I'm I'm 24, man. I'm 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 proud that I made it to 24, man. As a as a as a young black man in America, uh, coming from Philly, uh, going through everything that I've been through, um, man, losing loved ones. It's 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 really a blessing because. I just can't believe, like, even though I'm here, I, I still can't believe that I'm here. I still, still can't believe that even when I mess up, that that I'm still blessed and that I'm still able to go out there and, and play, uh, play the game, go out there and make an impact on people that I don't even know. Um, I have little kids that that look up to me, and, and I'm and I don't know it, but they look up to the person I am, and and um, I'm just glad that I, I, I'm able to set a positive example. Uh, because I would hate for for some kid not to be able to chase his dreams, uh, for some some kid not to be able to um, 
I don't want the kids to go on through what I went through with all the hardships, honestly. So I, I want to set a, a good example for them and, and show them that you you can be a kid like me and, and make it to the to to this stage or accomplish your dreams if if it, even if it's not sports. Uh, so I'm just I'm I'm proud that that I'm still here. I'm proud that I'm growing into uh, a, a man that uh, you know that my my family could be proud of. Uh, that God continues to bless me, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm glad to be alive. That's 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 what I'm on, man. This this quarantine got me thinking in my head 24/7, just thinking about life, and I'm just glad that I'm still living, um, especially everything that's going on uh, with COVID and uh, racial inequality. So uh, I'm glad that I get to wake up another day and, and get back out there, honestly. Awesome. Well, Josh, you have a fan of all of us here in this uh, chat. We can't wait to see your next move. I know your agent's on the phone. I should slide in my number so I can break that news when it comes to heck with Adam Schefter. Uh, but I'm going to hand the, 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 the convo over to uh, our one of our co-founders, Mike D. Candido, but I appreciate the convo, bro. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you too. Jason and Josh, thank you, Jason. Uh, greatly appreciate you facilitating the conversation, and uh, we're blessed to have you on the board and leverage your expertise. And uh, Josh, you know, I, I took so much out of this conversation. I think that the three things for me, first and foremost, is your perseverance. I mean, the challenges that you've had through your life and how you've persevered and overcome are admirable, to say the least. Uh, I think the second thing is humbleness. Uh, you told the story about a tough game against North Penn your sophomore year. Why would they make you offers? You know, I think 2,085 yards and 28 touchdowns your sophomore year would give you some offers. So uh, <laughs> the humbleness you had there. And you told the story of the first touchdown you scored at Notre Dame. And, you know, I remember the first start you had at Notre Dame where you had a 98-yard touchdown run. That's still the Notre Dame record. So uh, your humbleness is applaudable, especially for – uh, the question about what can the youth learn from you, uh, it would be easy for you to get caught up in the in the high life of your successes, but you didn't do that. And then I think the most impressive thing, Josh, about you as a young man is your selflessness. Um, <clears throat> through the whole conversation, you really talked about the importance of your family and wanting to do, help your family and and the challenges your family had and wanting to do better by your family. You talked about your teammates and the story about losing that playoff game being the thing you would take back the most or want to go back to the most. You talked about the community and giving back to the park and you talked about your faith. And, and I got to say, uh, as someone who's known your mom for 20 plus years um, and we started this not for profit, I know where you got it from. So April, you've done a fine job with your son, uh, with all your children and, uh, and Josh, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, uh, this is a wonderful discussion. Just a couple of things to uh, to finish up, everybody. Thank you for staying on longer uh, than we usually do. We really appreciate it. And uh, first and foremost, we'll send you a follow up email. Help us with the park. So uh, you can donate at dradamscommunitypark.com. We'll send you the detail. Uh, it's a great website we've developed, uh, and uh, we'd really love your help in in raising funds for it. Uh, it's not a uh, inexpensive uh, proposition. Uh, but we really, we really would uh, appreciate you helping us out with that. Um, follow us on Common Bonds uh, on social media or www.commonbonds.org. Uh, you get our monthly newsletters that April writes as our president each month. So uh, the the new one will come out tomorrow. And um, uh, we've we've got a number of things that we're focused on this month. We're going to focus on uh, inequality and bias and employment. So we'll have some great speakers uh, as the month goes along and some great resources. So, Josh, thank you again so much. April, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Jason, thank you. And, and we really appreciate everybody joining and uh, enjoy your evening. We look forward to seeing you in our next discussion. So take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josh.